Hey guys, so got a bit of a update of what I've been working on here. This motor. So I'll just explain what how the setup is here on this one. So we've got two driver coils. There's two two drive coils in the motor. This is the input for this one, and that's the output, the cap dump. That's the input for this this one here. And that's the output. That's this 12 volt battery is driving this one, and this 12 volt battery is driving this one. And it's charging. Each side has its own lipo battery. 6500 milliamp power battery, 16.8 volts when it's fully charged. I've actually done a capacity test on them and I get 6.8 amp hours out of them. So, what I have going on here is the cap bank is uh, parallel with this one. This is a 20 farad cap bank and this is a 1 farad cap bank and they are parallel together and the output is goes to this SCR with a Zener diode and this pot which can control the, the voltage that it dumps at this one is for this side this one is for this side it's reading the voltage of the cap banks It's under a load too right now. It's charging this high voltage bank up here. You can see it's a 500 farad. Well, it's 500 farad caps, right? 2.7 volt caps. These resistors on the top hold it at 2.5 volts each. It's good for 105 volts the way it is. Here's the voltage for that thing. Ninety point four and climbing. So what I have in here driving this is a. Uh, you can see in there there's the two drive coils. There's one there. And there's one up there, and then there's two high voltage alternator coils on the bottom down there. There's two of them in parallel, they're each 300 ohms of number 30 wire. So they easily put out over 100 volts AC. And there's the, the wires come out right there. And they go into each coil has its own separate bridge rectifier and then the, the DC from the bridge rectifiers is paralleled up right there it comes to the bank positive here negative here but I've been running these this setup here for quite a while and it's like even after I've tuned the motor, I got the motor tuned to, uh, I needed 350 hertz caps in there. And just replace the small capacitors right here. So, start with a higher value or a lower value and just work your way through it until you hit where it actually gets the best and then starts to deteriorate, that's where you stop. Uh, another thing too you'll notice is these meters are right on the money. This is for this one right here. And this one's reading 135 milliamp. This is right here. So you'll see in any of my other previous videos, 
of the input and output with these meters are right on the money. They're exactly what they've been showing me. The results are real. Because what I don't show in my videos, because it's a long process, is I have these battery testers. This one right there. This one's good for up to 24 volts. I can't remember exactly what it's good for. I think it's up to 30. You can discharge and charge with it, and you can put it on the on the graph, right? I use a old computer here. Let me see here. So I just go to this here. See, here's one of these. This is a 18650 cell charge and discharge curve. So you can do that, right? But what I do for my testing is I. Uh, I'll pull 5 amp hours out of one of those batteries with it, right, and I'll charge it, and then these ones will tell you the, the amp hours, and I've also compared these meters to that tester, and the results are almost identical, so I know these are right, and when you can put the 5 amp hours back into the battery, for less than five amp hours here, you know you got some, right? I also have these two that I use. These are for single cells. Like I don't have no shortage of battery testing equipment around here. And I do graph everything, everything's on record. So but I'm finding out that these pulsar picks aren't as efficient as in my previous videos where you just take the the output off of the output of the driver. I'm screwed up that view, right? The driver, right here, you take the output directly from the driver and put it to the battery. That's your best way to get results. This way here is going to give you good results for desulfating lead, lead acid batteries. It works really good for that. You know, AGMs or I got all sorts of types of batteries. I got golf cart batteries. All sorts of stuff I've been doing tests on for years. For years. So, and another thing too about these circuits, if you ever build one and you're noticing your input is going like this, like crazy. Is it, it'll do that for quite a while, especially if your motor's not under the load. And if you just start it up, it'll do that also. You'll notice it swaying back and forth for a really long time before it eventually like you know how magnet goes like this and finally it'll find its spot where it wants to stay. That's what these motors do in the rotor, right? I'll even demonstrate that. I'll take this off. I'll stop the rotor and start it again. It might do that. Sometimes it does it. Just see what it does. Stop this. Start it up again. I might be doing it now. Enough to put it out of lock. Sometimes it does it, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, see, you can see how it's waving around there now, right? But some, sometimes it gets really bad and it'll just stay like that for a couple of hours when you start it. It also depends on what type of load the motor is under. See? See, sometimes it'll take two, three hours for it to smooth out. That's under a pretty good load right now because it is charging this. 
I think. That's smoothing out pretty fast. It doesn't always do that. And I can get some pretty high pulses out just at a moment I'm only firing volt. Like these batteries are almost full. They're both getting pretty close to being full, so it's only getting a volt higher than a battery voltage, so it's not giving really that much of a pulse out. This one fires somewhere around 7.8, 17.8. This one fires something like 17.35. That's just how I have them adjusted. And what I've always noticed too with these motors for every single one that I've ever built is one side is always more efficient than the other side. Like one driver coil and bolt coil will use about the same amount of power as both sides but one will put out a little more of the, on the flyback for whatever reason that is. You can kind of see that in the scope how one, I think it's because of the, how, the, how it rotates. I've never done a solid state version like that to actually compare it to. And what else? That's about it. I have something coming up here for taking the high voltage cap and putting it back into the input. I'll be posting that later. What I'm going to be doing for that. And that's about it. In a long boring video, but just kind of wanted to explain how I do this stuff. And like I said before, you can see how accurate these gauges really are. 120, 121, and that's, this one's reading about 125. This one's saying 130, 138, 134 milliamps. And that one's reading about 135. I can still see the line there where it would be 140. Just to go to show you what my previous results were like. These are more accurate because they'll give you an average of what is actually happening. The highs and lows, it's only taking a reading. You know, it's not bouncing around like these ones are. It's actually giving you an average of what's going on. But as you can see, it charges up the pretty, pretty good. Like this is a really big cap bank. You can see how this is a 15, 20 watt bulb at 120 volts. for quite a while before it drains anything out of it. Just a lot of power stored up in that bank. probably pulling about 10 watts out of it continuously right now. So yeah, long boring video but just kind of figured I'd give an update. Thanks for watching guys, appreciate it.